Welcome back. I am so excited to start the next portion of our program. With me is Melissa Hoffer, who has a one-of-a-kind job. Massachusetts is the first state in the nation to create a cabinet level position for a climate chief. And Melissa is the first person to hold that role. Yes. <laughs> she comes to the job with deep experience at both the EPA and the state attorney general's office. Now she has a remit to tackle what she calls a defining issue of our time. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you for joining us. So we know there's an urgency. And I want to start with the big picture. What are the parameters of your job, and why is it important to have a climate chief? So I think I'm going to take those in reverse order and talk a little bit about why it's important, then we can talk a little bit about what. And the why is, at least in Massachusetts, and this is true for, for other state governments and until recently even for the federal government, um, climate was largely seen as an environmental issue. So that was something for EPA to take care of. Here in Massachusetts, it was something for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, it expressly was something that our DPU could not consider. And <clears throat> even though we had good climate legislation, since 2008, Massachusetts has had some of the nation leading pieces of legislation, including our Global Warming Solutions Act, our Green Communities Act. Um, but even with that, it, it still really lived mostly within the realm of planning. Now, we've done a very good job of decarbonizing our power sector here in New England. And that's in part because we had the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which was the first ever um, regulated uh, cap and trade system for a power sector in the United States. And it was also a function of the discovery of Marcellus Shale, which made the demand for coal go down tremendously. So we've, we've been able to accomplish some things, but we haven't really seen climate become an issue that is integral, that, that is in the bones of the other agencies, the Department of Transportation, for example, Health and Human Services, Emergency Response, um, ANF, our Administration and Finance Agency, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that they're doing later, um, that is responsible for buying all the things that the state uses. States and federal government buys an awful lot of stuff, so those purchasing decisions can have a huge impact on climate. So, there's really not a single office that is responsible for ensuring that all of those agencies are thinking about climate change and all of their relevant decisions. So that's the why. It's really to bake climate into the DNA of all of these state agencies. It's a whole of government approach. It's not unlike what the Biden administration did when it instituted the Domestic Climate Policy Office and put Gina McCarthy at the helm of that, along with David Hayes and Ali Zaidi. So these are, if you can think about it, it's a different kind of innovation. It's a administrative innovation in how we do government. And then what is, what is it that we're doing is the second part of the question. And that is largely spelled out in EO 604, which established the office and it puts a structure in place that places a secretariat climate officer at each of those agencies. So every Commonwealth secretariat now has a person who is responsible for climate change, and my team and I work with that person. In some instances, um, agencies like EEA or DOT have very specific legislative mandates that they must accomplish. So putting that on a time frame having regular reports on it, making sure there's an implementation plan so we understand, okay, we need to get to X many EVs by 2035. That's a great goal. How are we actually gonna do that and how do we know that we're getting there? So that's what my office has been doing. We've been doing that with each agency. Um, some of the agencies don't have specific legislative mandates, so we are working with the secretaries and their secretary climate officers to put in place plans that will lay out what their specific responsibilities are. The EO also created an obligation for my office to generate a report by June, which heaven forbid is right around the corner. 
And that report is laying out what are our strengths? What are we doing well across the board? And then what are our growing edges? Where, where do we need to change things so we can really hit these targets in time? And how can we learn from each other? Because some of the agencies have more expertise than other. Um, and so there's a real learning opportunity there. And I would say lastly is maybe a more ephemeral concept, but that is the one of building the connective tissue between these agencies. We have an incredible staff that care very deeply about this. Many of them are young people and they really want to make a difference, whether they are working on purchasing or whether they are working on health or whether they are working on air conditioning in prisons, they really want to see things change. So bringing them together, we just had our first little retreat and it was incredible. Their passion, getting to know each other, and then they're going to be the next generation of people who understand who to pick up the phone and help us get you know, this problem solved. So that's another piece of this that I think is equally important along with our own relationships among the cabinet secretaries. And the first thing that I did was establish a climate cabinet meeting. We meet every week as a cabinet. We meet monthly as a climate cabinet. And that keeps all of us at the highest levels apprised of each other's work and learning from each other there. Thank you so much. It's really great to hear from a leader like yourself and as a climate chief, the why, the what, and the how. And, uh, and then also to inspire the next leaders and to be able to make sure that we have people across Massachusetts working in this area and sustaining that. And I'm wondering, as, as you think about your leadership in this area, what were some of the pieces of advice that you got coming into the job that you thought were very helpful to you? And then how are you going to take those forward? Well, don't do it was a piece of advice I got from, from many people. <laughs> and I'm glad that I declined to follow that advice. But the best piece of advice that I got was from Administrator Regan, Michael Regan, who is the EPA Administrator. And when I was talking to him on my way out, um, I asked him, you know, do you have any last kind of parting words of advice for me? And he just looked at me and he said, Melissa, go hard or go home. <laughs> and I just love that because I, I admire him so much and he's such an incredible leader. And he is somebody who really has epitomized that for me. You know, he's coming and he's took on some issues that are really hard. Environmental justice, very, very hard. How do we solve those problems? How do you kind of change what you're doing inside an agency, technically, legally, so that you can really make sure you're satisfying that mandate? Um, how do you make sure that you're going to have the lens on it? So he is somebody who really epitomizes go hard or go home to me. And it also rang true because it was something like, I could really hear my late father saying something like that to me, so it really sunk in, and I often hear it. It's really wonderful to sort of hear these pieces of advice, and then also to think about what you've done so far and what Massachusetts has done. And I really want to commend you and your team and your organization on the climate action plan that is available on the web for those of you. And I'm going to make a big pitch today. So I hope you'll all come go home today and look on the internet on the 2022 Massachusetts Action Plan. It's really well laid out. And in one of the pieces that you just brought up, as well as one of the items that then in this action plan is on environmental justice. And we at the Chan School are really engaging communities and looking at environmental justice. I know David Cash and Region 1 EPA is also thinking about this framework and working with the WHO as well on climate resiliency, especially in low to middle income countries and with red zoning and the unfortunate issues around our country and discrimination against people of color. I'm wondering what is your team now doing for environmental justice related issues and what can we do more? Great. So environmental justice is at the center of everything that we're doing in equity. So it's a consideration that we have across the board. Um, it's, not, it's not something that sort of lies outside, but it's something that we're thinking about as we do all these things. And so I wanted to talk about three particular ways that it shows up um, in the climate space frequently. You know, one, we have, um, you have here Administrator David Cash from EPA Region 1 and Deputy Administrator um, Janet McCabe from EPA headquarters today, and they are in the process of putting out a transformative amount of federal funding through the IIJA or the bill and through the Inflation Reduction Act. And, you know, those 
those um, resources will be coming to communities. And the Biden administration has been um, innovative in that my read of these applications and these opportunities is that it is intended to de-silo within states. If you're a state receiving some of this funding, you kind of have to be having conversations. It's, it can't just be, you know, a Department of Environmental Protection. You kind of have to be talking to your colleagues within DOT and within some of the other areas that are going to be responsible for building decarbonization, for example. So that in itself is good, and it's driving a lot of cross-collaboration. And you know, those opportunities require, at their core, um, you know, a benefit to v disadvantaged communities. There's Justice 40, which makes sure that, you know, we're going to be investing at least 40% in, in disadvantaged communities. So, the, so those are the external things. But absent those, Massachusetts has long had a focus on environmental justice. It's had an environmental justice policy for many years. And so what we're trying to do with this, the three examples that I would like to give you, number one, it shows up a lot in terms of siting. We have an energy facility siting board. Massachusetts has not done a particularly good job of ensuring environmental justice considerations in siting, notwithstanding the fact that we have the policy. So about a week and a half ago, Secretary Tepper, um, who oversees the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, announced that we'll be convening a siting commission. Because the reality is we have to build a lot of stuff for this clean energy transition. We're going to need substations. We're going to need uh, interconnection cables. We're going to need transmission. We're going to need wind offshore and onshore. We need lots of solar. Um, we also need to be maintaining our forest for sequestration potential. And we need to be you know, protecting our coastal wetlands. So, so these are really tricky issues. People love clean energy, except when it shows up in their backyard. Sometimes it's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> we've had a very difficult time, for those of you who know New England, um, citing the necessary transmission. It looks like we, three might be a charm. Um, so these things are important. It also has shown up in um, citing of fossil fuel infrastructure. And I think, um, you know, without commenting where, you know, where that particular matter is, we've heard a lot from residents out in Springfield and Longmeadow about the proposal to have, you know, a... $65 million gas pipeline put right straight through um, a number of environmental justice communities. So I am personally taking time with that. I am, I am looking at that. I am carefully monitoring. I'm hearing from communities. I'll be spending a day out there next month. This stuff is really important. The other place where it shows up a lot is who gets the benefits of the clean energy transition. So that's sort of the definition for me in my mind, a working definition of um, just transition, that we want to make sure that as opportunities for jobs are created, we have people benefiting from those opportunities across the board. I will talk a little bit more about workforce in a moment, but we there's a, a huge need for, for workers right now at really every possible, you know, from entry level to, you know, folks with engineering degrees and beyond. So there's lots of opportunity, and we've been talking with our partners in the labor industry, and we've been talking with our, our uh, Secretary Jones um, and Secretary Howe, who are over economic development and labor and workforce development, about how to make sure that these opportunities are broadly available. The other place is how do you spend the money? And, um, you know, one of the things we've been focused on, and this is no surprise during the campaign, um, then A.G. Healy emphasized the desire to explore Green Bank um, and has tasked my office with making a recommendation on Monday about um, how we're, <laughs> we're going to do that, if we should do that, and what it's going to look like. So we've been spending an awful lot of time with that. And one of the things that we were very interested in, you know, the whole idea of a green bank is you're sort of recycling the money. You get the money, you're lending it out, you get that money back again, you leverage other money. So places like the Connecticut Green Bank have a leverage ratio of like seven to one right now, which means for every buck the state puts in, you're getting like $7 worth of clean energy development. <clears throat> All right, so it's a very good deal. We want to have something like that. And we want to make sure that we're doing something different with our bank. We don't want to be like other banks, which have really focused on clean energy investment as a way to grow the bank's balance sheet. Now, our bank has to have a healthy balance sheet. But the thing that we really want to focus on is decarbonizing the building sector for low and moderate income and affordable housing. Because I got to tell you, in Massachusetts is a little bit unique in that we own a bunch of our own affordable housing. Much of it was built in and around 1957. It does not have air conditioning. It does not have air conditioning. 
Much of it is in a floodplain. So this is an opportunity for us to go in, make the right steps, whether it's electrification, building envelope, efficiency, where we can reduce some of those resilience risks and, and have a real benefit for these communities and these people. Uh, it's it's fantastic to hear that you know you're focusing on environmental justice and and one of the things we heard earlier today was from community health workers and we are lucky to have in the audience community health workers from Springfield and working there with people that are affected by climate change and climate change associated events and how will you be helping marginalized populations communities that deal with these environmental justice issues to help engage in policy making? What is the process by which your team will be engaging them? So there's a, there's a key way that's coming up soon, which is that EPA has made available funding to, to all states. It's formula funding. It's not competitive. It's called the Carbon Pollution Reduction Grant. And it came in response to many states asking for additional funds to help them plan to be able to go after and receive the, the large amount of federal funds available through all agencies for this transition. So as a part of that, we'll be establishing stakeholder groups. And those stakeholder groups will be providing that specific type of policy advice to us. One of the stakeholder groups will be environmental justice and climate justice groups. So that's a very important way. And I, I think the other way is just having a very open door um, to hear from groups. And so when I mentioned the example of Longmeadow and Springfield, you know, those are examples where when people are coming with an environmental justice issue, um, East Boston is another one. That, that decision was a decision that was made prior to the Healy administration coming in. Um, but the company, the community wanted a hearing on that and we met with them. We offered to put a pause on proceedings so that we could review our legal options and that is where that stands now. So it's an open door. We're probably not always going to have the answer that everybody wants, but it's very important to us to be engaging. The other thing that the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs has done is hire the very first undersecretary for environmental justice. That's Maria Belen Power, who comes to us from uh, Chelsea Green Space in East Boston, and 14 um, other environmental justice positions within EEA who are going to be helping to ensure that we're considering, and not just considering, but taking into account environmental justice viewpoints in our policy making activities. Maria is actually coming out to Springfield with me next month. I want to just talk about youth here as well, because youth are also a group that are often not involved in the decisions that affect them. Um, I know from meeting with uh, clinical psychologist and uh, psychiatric doctor from MGH recently that our youth are having a very difficult time for a variety of reasons, but also because they have a high degree of anxiety and depression about climate change. They don't think we have it. And one thing that we know can help is if they are engaged and if they feel like they are a part of working on a solution and working towards something. So we are very, very committed. I just started a youth climate council um, and we're just, just about to close the application period on that. And that will be an opportunity to meet regularly with youth to get their views on policy. Right now, I think their priority goal is to have <clears throat> legislation passed that requires climate education in K through 12 public schools, um, which is a, a really laudable goal. And I'm very much looking forward to working with them because frankly, their, their energy is contagious. Um, and I am in awe of how poised and well informed they are about these issues. Um, so that's just another place where we're really trying to engage. Thank you. Uh, I can say it's really wonderful, and I am very proud to be part of Massachusetts and to know the Healy administration has such ambitious goals in climate change and sustainability as well, and that you're engaging the youth and engaging marginalized populations. What I think some of the goals that you will be carrying out in terms of powering Massachusetts with 100% electricity that's clean uh, by 2030 is fantastic. We've heard some of the hurdles that you've dealt with. What are some of the hurdles that we can perhaps help out with as an audience of academicians, of educators, uh, of, pub of the public, and as well as of media? What do you think the next best steps are? And I'll let that be my next last question because I think we know that there are, uh, we um, want to make sure there's time for some questions as well as time for Janet McCabe and, and her discussion. 
Thank well, you. thank you for that question. And I, I wanted to ask you all a question before I answer it, um, if you're comfortable. <clears throat> How many of you feel despair about climate? And how many of you feel rage about it? Who feels grief? And who feels optimism? All right. So a lot of us feel a mix of all of these responses to climate change. And I really appreciate this question because we need a sea change in how we talk about this issue. This is the first time in my career I've been working in this space for almost two decades where the conversation has really changed. I don't know if it's because the external signal of climate change is so clear, but it's very different now and people can see what's happening. And I have found that events like this, leaders of institutions are willing to kind of come up to me afterwards and say, you know, things are not looking so good, we really need to X, Y, Z. And my invitation is, would you please say that publicly? Would you please join Governor Healy, who is willing to take bold action on climate, but she can't do it without the backing of institutions like this one and many others. This is really a time to think very differently about how we've done stuff in the past. What can we do? We know what we need to do. We have to stop using dirty fossil fuels. We need to do that yesterday. We need to stop investing in dirty fossil fuels. We need to stop investing in all of the institutions that support the development and production of these fuels, whether it's insurance companies or whatever. That's a big thing that we need to do right away. We need to change how we are operating our own institutions. I was talking a little bit about changing how government purchases things. We have to start baking in a social cost of carbon, however we do it. You know, for us, we're going to be looking at asking for people for their carbon disclosures consistent with what CDP wants, what their greenhouse gas emission reduction goals are, what their climate risk is. You got to start telling us that stuff. We might not make a decision on it right away, but we need to know. And all of our institutions need to be doing that as well. We have to get very serious about it because I am sorry to say, I think we all know this in here, knowing who this audience is. This isn't going to be, you know, like switch out to an EV and you know, pop on the solar panels and we're done. We've lost our stable climate right now. The stable climate on which human civilization was built is now gone. So this is locked in. We all know the atmospheric resonance time of carbon dioxide and we need to deal with adaptation. So it's a time to really have frank conversations with each other. And I guess I would just ask you all in closing, my call to you would be to think about what would our world look like what would our built environment look like? What would our communities look like? What would things look like if we really acknowledged that we are interconnected, that we are a species that relies on the thriving of other species and a healthy ecosystem? How would things be different? And then my call to you, especially the students here, go out here and make that world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was fantastic to hear from you. We really appreciate your time. We know you're busy, and we are excited to be busy with you and to make sure that we can um, accomplish those goals and to be part of the efforts of the Healy administration to generate new knowledge, to generate new curricula, and to be able to help shape these policies and study them. So thank you. Thank you.